Well, we marched down the street, all of us, in hand in hand, in what in England is called a crocodile. Two kids, and you know, I was walking with Norm. And I still remember this, I was five years old. We were told, okay, you and you here, and you and you here, and you and you here. And we wound up with a family, and the father of the, of the family was a bookmaker. Bookmaking is legal because this is this is England, this is a racetrack town. And he worked on a racetrack. They were not very nice to us. They didn't want us, but they had no choice because if you had room, you had to, and, and a billeting officer came to your house, you had to take in evacuees whether you liked it or not, or suffer severe fines. Now, they did get a stipend for us. I think it was something like a dollar a week per kid. Now, it doesn't sound like very much. It wasn't very much, but the cost of living was slightly different in 1939. Two days after we left, the war was declared. Winston, Neville Chamberlain resigned, and Winston Churchill came in. This is not a rude gesture. It's supposed to be a victory. <laughs> Immediately, a blackout was instituted. You had to have, you had to cover all of your windows. You could not let any lights escape at night because of the airplanes coming in. Also, now I made a point of this out so you could see. You taped all the windows. You put sticky tape. Like it wasn't the scotch tape hadn't been invented, but it was brown sticky tape on the windows and a cross like that. The idea was if the windows got blown out, you wouldn't have as many little pieces of glass flying around. And barrage balloons began to appear. This is the tower, tower bridge. These big balloons, were blimps that were filled with with gas. The idea was that dive bombers, if they tried to come in low, might hit these balloons or the wires. That was the theory, and they would destroy the airplanes. In fact, I've read that they destroyed more of our airplanes than the Germans. <laughs> A lot of people who couldn't go into the, the military became air raid wardens. This guy is looking for, probably looking for a McDonald's, or, I don't know, but he's looking for something. <laughs> Posters like this appeared, propaganda posters, asking people to take care of evacuees. Well, nothing much was happening. So after three or four months, I don't know exactly, it was maybe three or four months, I came home. Norman stayed, but I came home. This period was called the Phony War. We weren't being attacked in England because the Nazis were busy attacking Denmark, Norway, Holland, Belgium and France, so they were otherwise engaged. I came home shortly thereafter. We sustained our first air raids. This picture is of a German plane, and this is London. It's actually bombing London. This, this kind of scene was commonplace. We saw it all the time. I was away. I didn't actually see this at that time, although I saw it later. London really wasn't rebuilt until the 1950s or 60s. But this, is, this was a very common occurrence. They put anti-aircraft guns in all the parks, and there were mobile anti-aircraft guns running around the streets, shooting at the planes as they, as they uh, came in. This is another scene, bomb damage. A lot of kids, a lot of parents brought their children home. They didn't want to be parted from their children, which you can understand. I, I don't know how I could be parted from my kid. So this is a poster saying, this is a policeman telling the kid he sh shouldn't be there. It was terrible. It really was, was unbelievable to be, to be bombed. Fortunately, Britain invented radar, and we had these towers around the coast which warned of the incoming planes. If it hadn't been for this, we would have lost the war. In 1940, the Germans really tried to, to destroy us, and that period is called the Battle of Britain. The, the best known plane at that time was the Spitfire. I don't know, anybody ever heard of the Spitfire? <laughs> this is a Spitfire and a dogfight. I actually took that picture from another plane. No, I'm lying. <laughs> the Germans dropped a lot of firebombs. These were small phosphorus bombs, and 
when they landed, that anything that they hit, they, they burned. And you couldn't put them out with water. You had to throw sand on them. <clears throat> well, my mother decided this was not a place for me to be. And she sent me to a village called Fordham. My school, for some reason, I never did find out why, had moved from New Market to Fordham, which was five miles away. And this is the house where I lived. However, the people didn't take good care of me. And this is what it looked like. <laughs> you remember Alfred E. Newman, What Me Worry? Well, they copied it from me. My mother came to see me the first time and saw me looking like this. She said, you're not going to stay here. So she took me home again. <laughs> this was Mom. Back home again. But shortly thereafter, the bombing started again. These are some shots. We took shelter in air raid shelters. Every night we go down into the air raid shelter. The air raid shelter that we went into was in Spitterfield's Market and was formerly a place where they ripened bananas, way underground. And the roofs, the ceilings were reinforced. This was my neighborhood. I'm from the east end of London. It's like the Lower East Side of New York. This picture is actually Pettico Lane Market on a Sunday morning. Anybody ever been to Pettico Lane Market? Nobody's been to Pettico Lane. Okay. It's a famous place. There's a number of streets where the market is, and there have been markets since the 1500s. And they used to sell old clothes, and hence Pettico Lane. My house, our flats were maybe a half a block down that way. We lived in these uh, apartments, mm -hmm. and we lived, that, actually that is our bedroom window, the, where the arrows pointed. Mm -hmm. I still remember standing on that top balcony and seeing the sky red because they had bombed the German dock, the, the Germans had bombed the London docks. Mm -hmm. And the entire London docks were on fire. Next day, my mother took me and my sister, and we went back to Fordham. Yeah. However, my mother was not going to let me stay with the people with whom I had stayed before. We moved to Fordham, went to Fordham, found a person who was called a billeting officer, who took us and said, I've got a place you can stay, you can stay with Miss Fleet. So we went to see Miss Fleet. You all, I'm sure you're all familiar with Fordham, right? You all know Fordham. <laughs> That's where I, that was Ada Fleet's house. The village had maybe 200 inhabitants. It was not a big place. It's on, it's not on many maps. And Ada Fleet's house was this one. This happens to Martha standing here. This house was built about 1830, 1840. And it was two rooms upstairs and two rooms downstairs. And we walk down this little path, you see where the entrance is to this little house, and the billeting officer knocked on the door, and nothing happened. And then the, slowly, slowly, the door creaked open, and I was terrified. I thought this lady was a witch. She was about four foot eight, four foot nine. Her hair was messed up, she had no teeth. And I was absolutely petrified. Remember, I was six years old. She wasn't a witch. Anything but. Aunt Ada, at age 83, her name was Ada Fleet, and I loved her dearly, and I corresponded with her until she died in 1963. She looks very pretty there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I'm, good. I'm a good photographer. <laughs> I didn't take this picture, but anyway. 